Welcome to the Good Shepherd in the Child podcast, where we explore the spirituality of the Christian child using the method of catechesis of the Good Shepherd. I am your host, Carrie Mecki Lozano. Today, we are continuing our journey through some of the chapters in The Religious Potential of the Child by Sophia Cavalletti. We have a new page on our website where you can find what podcast episodes that correspond with different chapters of our books. And so for the next few episodes, we are covering some of the chapters we have not yet covered in the religious potential of the child. So you can grab some friends, grab some parents, grab some catechists, and gather together this summer and take one of the books that we have on our list, Religious Potential of the Child, Religious Potential of the Child for the 6 to 12-year-old, Joyful Journey, Life in the Vine, Ways to Nurture the Relationship with God, and dive into that book together. And you can use our podcast series page to help if you would like to have a podcast episode go along with your book study. We also have some questions for a book study over the religious potential of the child. You can find all that information in our show notes, links to those pages to help you have an amazing summer book study. So Katie Beetle Rice is joining us on the podcast today. We are diving into chapter seven of the religious potential of the child. This chapter is on prayer and it is so beautiful. I wish I could just read you the whole chapter because Sophia's wisdom is wonderful. And so Katie and I dive into like, what is the prayer of that three to six year old child? How can we as adults foster that prayer life? And so, so much more. I hope you enjoy. Katie, welcome to the Good Shepherd and the Child podcast. Oh, thank you. It's a joy to be with you today. Katie, would you tell us a little bit about who you are and your involvement in Catechesis of the Good Shepherd? Oh, sure. Let's see. Um, I am a wife, mother, and catechist who currently lives in Boise, Idaho. And I came to the Catechesis of the Good Shepherd when my son, who's now 14, when he was (laughs) two years old. So I've been doing this work for, for 12 years. Uh, At the time I started, I was the director of religious education at a parish in Juneau, Alaska. And uh, so I was able to, with the help of many catechists, um, get an atrium for levels one, two, and three going. And then about six years ago, my family and I moved to Boise. And since then, I've been a volunteer catechist here, while um, I also get to lead formations for level one and level two catechists. So that's been a blessing. I didn't realize that you were a formation leader for one and two. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah. That um, I just became a formation leader for level two about um, three years ago. So it's been really wonderful. I, I love being informations. There's so much that we learn when we come and we pray together Mm -hmm. and we listen together Mm -hmm. to God and the child. Mm -hmm. I like people's questions. Whenever people ask questions, it's like, ooh, I haven't thought of it from that angle. Yes. Oh, yeah. There's so, we're always going deeper. It's Mm -hmm. it's pretty awesome. Mm -hmm. Very fluid work. Well, Katie and I met, it was nine years ago. Was it nine? Wow. Because I was pregnant with Jackson, who is eight now. So that's how I okay. gauge anything in life. Right? Yeah. So nine years ago, you and I did level three formation together here in Texas. You came all the yes. way from Alaska to join us. I did. I did. You it did. Was hot. <laughs> it was a great, <laughs> great experience. Yeah. I loved our level three formation. I think you and I ended up sitting side by side. And then when Jackson was born, I got to coo over him. Babies <laughs> at formations are the best. <laughs> yes. Yes. That's one of my favorite things about Good Shepherd is that it's very baby friendly. Yeah. Oh, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> from the mouth of babes, right? Yes. Yes. So Katie and I are going to begin this conversation by praying a prayer of a child. In the chapter that we're diving into today, chapter seven of Religious Potential of the Child on Prayer, Sophia provides for us some very beautiful prayers that were written down as the child was praying it. And so we thought it would be really beautiful for that to be the beginning of our conversation. Yeah, and it's actually, it's it's almost kind of like a litany that was given by a group of children at Via Dei Orsini, so Sophia's atrium, 
after hearing the first presentation of baptism. So there's spontaneous prayer that a catechist wrote down, especially right now as we're in the Easter season. What a beautiful time to pray with these Mm -hmm. children's words. Mm -hmm. Yes, this is perfect. So I'll start. Thank you for the light. Thank you, Jesus, for giving us our hearts. Thank you, Jesus, for giving us our joy. Thank you for giving us our life. Thank you for creating the whole world. Thank you, Jesus, for giving life to me and everyone else. Thank you, Jesus, for creating everyone and for giving us life. Thank you, Jesus, for making our houses too. And when it rains, we take cover in our houses. (laughs) Thank you, Jesus, for baptizing us. Thank you for giving us all our life. Thank you, Jesus, for making us be born in the sheepfold. Thank you for giving us that beautiful gift. Thank you for giving us the gift. Thank you for creating everyone. Thank you, Jesus, for creating us in the sheepfold. Thank you, Jesus, for when we die, we go to paradise. Thank you, Jesus, for always giving us light. Thank you, Jesus, for sending us this light from heaven right into our hearts. Thank you for giving us bread. Thank you for giving us everything. Thank you for giving us wine and holy water. Thank you, Jesus, for giving us food to eat. Thank you for making plants and wheat. Thank you for making soup, too. (laughs) Thank you for creating us all. Thank you, Jesus, for making us strong and good. Thank you for making us work. Thank you for leading us into our beautiful sheepfold. Thank you, because we are your sheep. Thank you for coming into our hearts. My body is happy. Jesus, you gave us light. Jesus, I am all yours. Thank you for the gift. Thank you for the beautiful gift. Thank you for everything. Thank you for creating us. Thank you for the gift. Jesus, thank you because I am one of your sheep. Jesus, thank you for leading us into the sheepfold. Jesus, I want to be good. Jesus, thank you for always coming to look for us. Thank you, Jesus, for making me one of your sheep. My grandmother is dead, but I'm happy she is with Jesus. Amen. Amen. These prayers, these two prayers, they're such beautiful examples of how the children pray. Yeah. And I I think when you look at this chapter, chapter seven in Religious Potential of the Child, and you flip through it, Um, These are only a few of what I like to think of as these litanies of the children that Sophia has recorded and Mm -hmm. given us. Mm -hmm. And she says right at the beginning of the chapter, if we want to nurture the child's prayer, we need to observe, we need to experience Mm -hmm. um, how they pray. Mm -hmm. We need to pray with them. Um, And it's, it's such, I love coming back to these words and praying praying with the young child. I am always impressed that they have been recorded. And it always is a call to me as a catechist and as a mother that I need to start listening more Mm. and enough to like realize that what this child just said is prayer or maybe what this child just did is prayer and that it's worthy of me remembering. Pam Moore in Taste and See, she writes after each atrium time where the things that the children said or did and where she saw God in the atrium. And whenever I see this in this chapter, Mm -hmm. how Sophia, or maybe it wasn't Sophia, but one of the catechists in the room with the children (laughs) wrote down what the children said. It always calls me to kind of pay attention to these moments with the children a little bit better. Yeah. And I think that is something that is so 
wonderful about this work is that just like Maria Montessori, who said, you know, look where I'm pointing, look to the child. <laughs> don't mm -hmm. don't look at me, but look at the child. Sophia and Jana do the same thing. Um, they they have these beautiful texts that they've written. And it's almost like they're saying, you know, don't look at us. Yes, we've put these words down, but this has been revealed yes. to us by the children. Mm -hmm. And the fact that Sophia, this, you know, theologian who taught in university courses, mm -hmm. that she would put in print all of these words from the children is so beautiful. And mm -hmm. I love when we look at this list, we see that the children are praying for very concrete things. Thank you for soup. Thank you for our houses. Mm -hmm. And then right next to it, they are praying about the deepest mysteries of our faith. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you for giving us the gift. Thank you for creating us in the sheepfold. Um, thank you for sending us light from heaven right into our hearts. Yeah. And I think right here we see that metaphysical child that I know we've mentioned in the podcast before. Uh, this child who is so here and so sensory oriented, yeah. but then also so in tune with the spiritual, with the reality of the the spiritual realities of life. Yeah. And they can be in both worlds simultaneously. They can yes. be living in the physical with the soup and the house and the mm -hmm. rain mm -hmm. while also being a sheep in the sheepfold. Yeah. It is not compartmentalized the way it is for for us as adults. Yeah. I think sometimes too, when we're in the atrium, I think that's a great reminder of trying to write down whatever we observe. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes the children will say something and it is so clearly a theological, spiritual, beautiful church, uh, truth that we're like, oh yeah, I need to remember that. And other times they will say something that is so simple yes. that the profundity won't strike us until later. Mm -hmm. And so that Sophia, it, it seems to me like she didn't go through and edit out, oh, I'm going to choose the prayers that will, you know, make the most impression on adults. But really, you know, we're having, um, thank you for giving us bread. Thank you for giving us food to eat. These really um, simple prayers right next to the really profound, profound prayers as well. Right. And I think it's important to also note that... It's not always words, yes, especially for children. But and we'll talk about it more as this conversation mm -hmm. continues. But um, here we're talking about these beautiful verbal prayers that the children have given, but also to open up our eyes to the nonverbal prayers that the children have. Yes, yeah. So often that prayer is one of of presence. We could say just being here in the moment. Sophia mentions in the chapter, in fact, it's on, on page 90, right above how children pray. She says, we do not think it would be an exaggeration to speak of true contemplation. Mm -hmm. And so this full silence of the children, this true contemplation. And that's why there's such a value in the practical life that we do in the atrium and also at home. That yes. um, because when a child is sitting there spooning or maybe coloring or doing something that doesn't take much thought, sometimes mm -hmm. they're who knows what they're thinking about. Who knows if they're thinking about that prayer, that word that you said, or the the scripture that was just said or proclaimed in the atrium. And they're sitting there and spooning and thinking about the angel Gabriel coming to Mary yes. or the good shepherd and his sheep. We have no idea what the communication that's happening mm. between the child in the silence. And that is prayer. That is prayer. Yes. I remember a moment in, in Juno where a homeschool family um, had their older children were coming to the atrium and one of the daughters had invited the mom to come and observe. Um, she really wanted her mother to experience this. And so her mom found a babysitter for the, the younger ones and came into the atrium. And she shared this experience with me later. She said, I was sitting there and I was watching my five-year-old and she spent 20 minutes doing uh, wood polishing. 
and polishing a, a simple statue that we had in the atrium. And the mom shared with me, you know, I, I felt myself becoming a little bit frustrated thinking there are so many beautiful, amazing materials in here. Why are you spending so much time just polishing wood? And then at one point, her daughter looked up and said, mommy, isn't God beautiful? Mm. And so she was having that moment of contemplation right there while she was also involved with this work of her hands. Mm -hmm. Which leads right into the work itself is can be prayer. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So here we do have Sophia, you know, writing down these responses of the children. But that's, yeah, that's definitely not to say that all prayer is spoken prayer, but work Mm -hmm. is prayer. Silence is prayer. Our being and our not being. (laughs) All prayer. Mm -hmm. Prayer is the the listening and the response from God. And so anything that is happening in our lives, not even limited to the atria, um, in, it can be a prayer. And Sophia talks about that in this chapter whenever she goes to um, the section called Fixed Hours of Prayer. She talks about yeah. when to pray and that the constant religious call during the child's day. So the whole day can be prayer. The whole day we go outside mm-hmm. and the weather is beautiful. Oh, wow, God, you are such a beautiful artist. Thank you so much for this day. Um, you know, we have dinner and we have that rote prayer that we tend to say, but also thank you God so much for this prayer because like these prayers that you and I just read, Thanksgiving is such a big part of, especially for the child up to like seven and eight, Yeah, um, the Thanksgiving. And so for us to model, to reflect what the child of that age prays, which it tends to be a lot of Thanksgiving. And so modeling that throughout the whole day of thank you, God, so much for my comfortable pillow. Thank you, God, Mm -hmm. so much for my beautiful daughter. Modeling that life itself is prayer. It's not limited to the atrium or mass. Yes. I think it goes to, um, at the very beginning of each chapter, Sophia in Religious Potential, the child, uh, Sophia gives a Bible verse. And the Bible verse that starts this chapter says, by the mouths of children, babes in arms, you set a stronghold firm against your foes. And as I was thinking about this first, I realized that this uh, psalm, Psalm 8, is one that we pray in the Liturgy of the Hours uh, every four weeks. It comes up in morning prayer. And the antiphon for it is, on the lips of children and infants, you have found perfect praise. Mm. And so here in the Bible, the sense that very young children, infants, even before they're making discernible speech are offering to God perfect praise. Mm -hmm. They're being in itself Mm -hmm. perfect praise to God. Mm -hmm. And so they're beautiful models for us. So it goes back to what you said at the beginning of Sophia challenging us to learn how children pray so that we can learn how to have perfect praise, just like the children and infants do. Yes, yeah. And I think that they're... For everyone who comes into the atrium or spends time, you know, with our children at home, we realize there's so much that they mm-hmm. teach us, so much they they call us to and challenge us to. Mm-hmm. I think we can see that too. Um, Sophia talks at the beginning of the chapter as well about how there's such a great difference between the religious life of the adult and the child. Yes. And that this child, especially before the age of six, they have a different um, way of being than yes. we do in the world. And so she, she says that because of this difference, it forbids us to impose our own prayer guidelines on children. We risk leading them along a path that is not theirs. We risk extinguishing the spontaneous expression of their relationship with God and give rise to the idea that when we pray, we say certain fixed things without necessarily adhering to them within ourselves. We could separate prayer from life in children. Mm. And so it's so important, um, as we want to serve children's spiritual lives for us to observe how they live the spiritual life. But then it's also such a gift for us as adults to take 
their spiritual life as a model, as something mm-hmm. that can lead us deeper mm-hmm. into our own relationship with God. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this, I also had that quote highlighted. It's yeah. would definitely one we should read like two or three times in six yes. because yes. It's, it's almost scary as an adult who works with children that it is possible for us to extinguish their prayer life, the spontaneous expression mm. of their relationship with God. If we do not take the time to learn how they pray and create an environment that fosters uh, fosters that type of prayer, um, yeah, and or we push our own type of prayer life onto the mm-hmm. young child, we could extinguish their spontaneous expression to God. Like that's that's pretty big. It is, yeah, it, it is. Sophia's Sophia's being real here, yeah, <laughs> with us. And I I think it's it's an important warning for us to heed in a way because there is so much good in all kinds of prayer, right? I mean, we have our sacred prayers, uh, the church that we hold dear, a sacred, precious treasure for us. We have our prayers of petition that as adults, our older children, we so often do. We want to hold up the needs of the world. Uh, And yet, that's not the way of the very young child. Mm -hmm. The way of the very young child is this spontaneous enjoyment of the relationship with God, Mm -hmm. the spontaneous deep enjoyment and gratitude for all that God has given us. Mm -hmm. How does Sophia speak into as adults? How can we support the prayer of children? Yeah. You know, she gives a couple, she gives several different ideas, but the one that she starts out with is the importance of creating an environment Mm -hmm. for prayer. And we know about this from the importance of creating an environment in the atrium, right? That children need to have a place where they can pray. But also, I think what you were saying before about in everyday life, recognizing the call to to prayer. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of a both and. Um, So one way we support their prayer is by... uh, is by setting up a prayer table, either in the atrium or at home, um, ideally both, and that this prayer area would have items of beauty that would speak to the children. So oftentimes, one or two beautiful statues, maybe of the Holy Family, of the Good Shepherd, having a few pieces of of sacred art, having a San Damiano crucifix, Mm -hmm. All of these things that can call to the to the children, mm-hmm. and then also having at this place, having uh, it set up so that it calls to the children to come to come away and sit for a while. So a small mm-hmm. cushion or a kneeler that might invite the child that says, "This is a place for you to come uh, when you want to particularly listen and talk to God." Mm-hmm. And then also having some items uh, that speak to the richness of the sacraments of the church. So having a candle there that can be lit. Uh, My godson who just turned four, he has a prayer table at his house and his mom and dad have put a little, um, put a little uh, bottle with holy water Mm, on it. And it's mm -hmm. one of those where you can squeeze out a little drop. So Mm -hmm. it's lasted since he was two now and it's still mostly full, but he can squeeze out a little bit of holy water and bless himself with it. I like that. So something sensory as well. I love just on like a practical level, Sophia spoke about like changing the statues with the seasons and changing the prayer colors with the seasons. And I think that that's really important, especially for beauty. Um, yeah. That's one thing Catechesis of the Good Shepherd has taught me is the importance of beauty. For example, if maybe if the statue has, you know, the hand of, of Mary has broken or if it's not as kind of aged and not as beautiful anymore, or this picture might be more of a childlike picture, like something maybe you'd mm. put in a nursery and not necessarily sacred art, those things matter. And those things are important. You want to have something that's beautiful that draws the child into a place of prayer and contemplation. It's almost like Visio Divina, where you can sit and look at this statue, you can look and sit at this religious art, you can look and sit with this word or the Bible, the beautiful Bible that we're going to put on the table. Mm. 
that beauty will draw the child into God, who is yeah. beautiful. And we could say too that the way that we set this environment says more than even our words can. Yes. So the way that we set it shows our respect for the child's prayer mm-hmm. and calls to them in a different, even a different way. So putting precious objects, even breakable objects on the prayer table that mm-hmm. they can handle lets them know um, how much we respect their prayer and how these items are are for them, how it's a place for mm-hmm. them. Mm-hmm. And I think changing the prayer table too as our children grow. So making sure when they're young, um, there is always a place that is appropriately sized for them. But then as children grow older, adding different furnishings uh, to the prayer table that will continue to, to call to them. Yeah. And children have opinions about all of this. So oh, like, yes. I have children from 17 down to eight months. So mm-hmm. you could ask your children as they grow, what well, what do you think we should add to the prayer table? What do you think we could gift God on this table for him? And, you know, sometimes children, especially the elementary age and down child would want to draw pictures for God, or even if it's just scribble, like it all has value sure. in their hearts for him. And so it could be an offering to him. Yeah. Yeah, that is, that's definitely true. And I think uh, welcoming whatever the children want to bring to that prayer prayer table. Uh, Sometimes they'll want to bring autumn leaves or a pine cone or a special rock that they found. So gifts from nature, Mm -hmm. welcoming, welcoming their contributions to it. Mm -hmm. Or a toy. I've seen children like bring something Mm. that's special to them to the prayer yeah. table. And then also, I've also had kids be very uninterested in the prayer table. But yes. that is just a physical thing. It is not the all-encompassing of their prayer. And so if a child is not interested in the prayer table itself, there are so many other ways that we can foster um, and support the prayer of children. Oh, definitely. And it might be that it's not um, a physical space, but it could be an object that, that calls them to prayer. I had one child in the atrium in Juneau when we first, after we, shortly after we started, a little boy. And when he came into the atrium, the first thing he would do is go to the prayer table, pick up the olive wood comfort cross we had, so just big enough to fit in his hand. And he would take that cross and he would put it into his sock so that it was <sighs> nestled against his ankle. And um, at first, I, I kind of wanted to, you know, invite him to, to not put <laughs> the cross <laughs> in his sock. Um, but I think by the grace of God, I, I, I was quiet and just observed. And what came to me after a few times of him doing this was that he he wanted this as close to him as he could have it. Mm. And so at one atrium session, I actually, I, I sent him home and I said, this is a gift um, for this, for this little boy. And his parents ended up buying another cross that we kept at the atrium. But his mom did tell me that he would keep this cross underneath his pillow and oftentimes carry it around with him throughout the day. Mm. And so it could, it could be um, an item that calls them to prayer. Yeah, you never well. know what's going to like pull on their heartstrings. How right. God, it's going to speak to somebody. It's amazing yeah. what he uses. One thing that she spoke about that you see in the children, especially the level one child, which is what she's speaking about in this book, mm-hmm. is the need for rich language, which our yeah. faith does a beautiful job of providing beautiful words. Mm-hmm. But I think sometimes as adults, we give too many beautiful words. And right. Good Shepherd has taught us to be more essential. So just to say, oh, like amazing God or everlasting mm. Father, just those two words, everlasting Father. And that, just stop. Don't yes. say anymore. Just. <laughs> yeah. Sophia so often says that for the youngest children, we want to give them rich food and not much of it. Yes. And so we do want to offer, yeah, these words that we hold so dear but not to try and give them all of them. Mm -hmm. Even um, speaking about how instead of giving the entire Hail Mary, the entire Our Father, the entire Magnificat, just lifting up a few words. Mm -hmm. So how just saying Hail Mary Mm -hmm. can be a prayer. 
or just lifting up my soul magnifies the Lord Mm -hmm. and stopping there. Mm -hmm. This whole, um, I think as adults, oftentimes we, because we want to give our children all good things, we have this desire that they would learn and treasure the prayers of our tradition. Mm -hmm. And what Sophia lifts up to us is that this will naturally come about, but she says, we do not spoil it by making children memorize This will happen naturally through the spontaneous repetition of a passage that is particularly striking. Mm -hmm. And I love that sense that the words in themselves call to the children so much that learning these words by heart will come about, Mm -hmm. that they will want and desire this gift. And I've had that experience in the atrium before, especially with children who love the parable of the Good Shepherd and just want it to be read to them over and over and over again, that at some point when I'm reading these words, they'll just come in in chorus Mm -hmm. with some of the verses that have particularly touched their hearts Mm -hmm. that are now naturally theirs. Mm -hmm. I think in all of this, it's very important for the adult to take a co-place of prayer as well. Mm. For example, with the words, Hail Mary, as we offer these beautiful words to the child, Hail Mary. But if, if I'm saying these beautiful words, my soul magnifies the Lord. If I'm saying these beautiful words, just as because I'm wanting the child to hear them, Mm. or am I saying these beautiful words as I myself am sitting and pondering the beautiful words that is coming out of my mouth. The child receives it so differently depending on how the adult Mm -hmm. stance is. As the co-prayer, if that's not a word, but you know what I'm saying, the co-person that is sitting and responding to God as well. It really makes a huge difference in how the children receive. Oh, definitely. Sophia says in this chapter, we want to offer an education to prayer and not to prayers. Mm -hmm. And I think one way of looking at that is in the atrium, as the adult, we we are not the teacher. That's the Holy Spirit. uh, That's God. That's Jesus. And so we are also in this co-listening stance with the children. So we do not presume to teach them how to pray. But to offer this education to prayer is really to pray with them, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. to be in this to be in this place of listening to God with yeah. the children, allowing ourselves to have an encounter mm-hmm. as well. It's total disposition shift for the adult as well. I so appreciated the section on the kerygma mm-hmm. in this yes. book. This. That section is so short. It's like what, mm-hmm. two paragraphs long, but it's so important. This is that, that the fact that the prayer as a response, but first we must offer rich kerygma. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it goes back to the theme that we hear over and over again in Sophia and Jana's writing about the covenant with God always begins with God, with the mm-hmm. gift of God. Mm-hmm. And so before we can respond, we must first receive. And so kerygma, the good news, is proclaimed first. Mm -hmm. And then we come to the response of both the child and the adult. And it seems like deeper we can encounter this kerygma, the deeper the response is. Mm Mm-hmm. And Sophia offers an interesting idea here for the catechist that she says, if the prayer of the child doesn't seem to be going, if it doesn't seem to be be as deep, look to how you're presenting the curriculum. Yes. How can you give this in a richer way? Mm-hmm. So it's not, it's not a deficit within the child, uh, but it's a call to us to see how can I serve this particular child better? How can I offer this kerygma better? Yeah, she she speaks about that right at the very end. She says, prayer can offer us a way of examining our work. 
Like I've never thought of it that way before, but it's so true. If the child has not entered into a deeper level of prayer, then the child has not encountered the charisma, the good news. They have not first received. And so it's such a way for us. So we should evaluate ourselves as the Mm. adults. Um, How have we offered the good news? Have we offered it in a way for them to receive it? Um, Is the environment set up in a way for them to receive it? Um, All those different things that we do have control over to see Mm -hmm. if, they're conducive for the child to receive the charisma. And like you said, the deeper level that they receive the charisma, the deeper their prayer will be. So it is a good measuring stick for us. Yeah. And I I think another way that we support the child's prayer is really by allowing time for their responses. So we could offer a charisma that is, is rich and deep. We could spend time with the words of God, with the child. But then sometimes I think as adults, we get so worried about sitting in silence mm. with children that we rush right on to the next thing. Yes. And so allowing that beat at the end uh, of a presentation, um, allowing for the, the natural rhythms of the child, as Sophia says, which are naturally much slower than ours, allowing them to take over mm-hmm. um, so that they can have that, that moment. It's so true. And silence itself is a form of prayer. And our world moves so fast. Mm-hmm. And sp- even for these youngest children, their world moves so much faster than their, really, sh- their disposition a lot's for. And so kind of that time in the atrium or that time in prayer in our homes to get really comfortable with silence. Because yeah. I don't know about you, Katie, but for me, whenever I pose a wondering question, mm. especially for the level one child, or I offer that beat of silence afterwards of, you know, is there anything we'd like to say to Jesus? Most of the time, there's they don't say anything. There's yeah. silence. And so getting comfortable with that silence so that that itself can be prayer or whatever is happening. And it's and Sophia speaks Sophia speaks about how the silence is not the absence of noise. Mm, it's a yes. different type of silence. It is not um, the kind of silence where, you know, after you've yelled or after you have called for silence and then right, everybody right. be quiet. It's not that type of silence. It's it's a pregnant silence. Mm. It is a silence where there's things percolating inside of us. There's thoughts moving. There's encounters happening. And we have to get comfortable with it to the point where we can sit for 60 solid seconds and let yeah. there be silence for a little while. Where yeah. else in our life or the child's life do they have silence? Right. And it's such a need. It's a it's a need as adults. I don't think we always realize that we have. When we think about silence... The children, when they're given the opportunity, will often just sink into it and relax into it in a way that we wouldn't expect Mm -hmm. from three to Mm -hmm. six-year-olds. And so when we notice um, their bodies relaxing, we notice this deep silence to not be in a hurry to move away from that. Mm-hmm. I've had a, a few experiences with the Pentecost prayer service where we light candles from the gift we'd like to receive from the Holy Spirit that year. I've experimented the last few years of having my assistant catechist go back to the atrium at the end of this celebration just down the hall And I sit by the lit candles and I tell the children, when you are ready, you may go back to the atrium and choose work. Mm. And I've been amazed that some, a a, a few different times, there have been children who will sit there in the glow of the candles for 10, 15 minutes. Wow. Level one children. Level one children. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Three, four, five year olds. Um, And and it's not a silence that is being imposed upon them, uh, but that they're freely choosing it. Mm -hmm. And it's such a beautiful, um, 
it's just a beautiful moment of prayer for us as the adults. I think there's nothing like sitting with a young child in contemplation. I agree. So, I agree. So beautiful. I think it's important that from your story to note that Pentecost is at the very end of our atrium year. <laughs> yes, that is true. So it's true. not something to expect yeah. at the very beginning. Silence is also something that has to grow with the yes. adult and the child. Yes. You can't expect a three-year-old to um, sit for 15 minutes in silence when they have never yeah. done that before. It is something that grows. And so it takes like, okay, we're going to sit for 30 seconds mm-hmm. and then sit for a minute. And I, t- I like to do it at the end of my atrium time after we've gathered back together at the prayer table and marveled at the beautiful prayer table and sang some songs. We play the silent game and we mm-hmm. sit in silence for a little while. And then I will walk silently over to the door and I will silently, as quietly as I can, say each of their names. And I try very hard to say it as quietly as my body <sighs> is capable. And I'm always amazed that they hear their names because mm-hmm. they have created silence. And it's it's beautiful. It It is. They, they love it. And there's a a peace after it, a peacefulness, I think that we feel within ourselves, a peacefulness within the children that really shows that this is a need that they have Mm -hmm. and something, it's like a muscle that grows. So yeah, at the very beginning of the year, we start out with, with very, very few, very few moments where we're sitting silently and then slowly slowly growing them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I uh, went through Montessori formation, um, just finished it a year ago. And one of the things that my Montessori formation leader said was that before she does silence, she gets consent from all the children. Mm. And so she goes around and asks them by name, would you like to make silence? Would you like to make silence? And so this very important part that this silence is never something that we as the adult would impose, mm-hmm. but is something that we maybe would provide the atmosphere for and invite the children to if if they so choose it. I like that. I like yeah. that a lot. And I always love the Montessori way of talking about silence. Would you like to make silence like yes. a noun? Yeah, I, I love that. Yeah, something we create together. Man, there are so many things in this chapter that are just so beautiful. There were so many times as I was rereading it to prepare for this conversation that I was like, oh, we should just read that whole paragraph. <laughs> yes. Oh, we should just read that whole paragraph. I have a lot of stars next to paragraph. <laughs> yes. paragraphs for that reason. Oh, um, definitely. It's a very beautiful and rich book. And I mean, chapter. And I think that it really goes to what you were saying about the psalm that the children's prayer and praise is perfection. Yeah, and it is something that we can constantly go back to mm-hmm. as adults to be formed ourselves mm-hmm. by this prayer of the young child, by the way that they enter so deeply into a conversation with God, the way that it's a, a whole person thing for them right mm-hmm. here, right now, they are present with God, with the Good Shepherd. Mm-hmm. Well, thank you so much, Katie, for joining us on the podcast. I really appreciate you taking the time to share with us. Thank you for having me. So nice to talk to you, Carrie. Thank you all for listening to this week's episode of the Good Shepherd and the Child podcast. I have links in my show notes for if you would like to grab a copy of The Religious Potential of the Child, the newest third edition. And I also put a link in there for if you would like the book Taste and See that we refer to by Pam Moore. This week, we are lifting up our benefactor member, Mustard Seed Training. They are a small group of home-based Christian artists in Northeast Ohio who are approved by the United States Association of Catechesis of the Good Shepherd as a vendor member. So you can go check out their website, which is mustseed.org, to see their beautiful homemade materials. This podcast is sponsored by the United States Association of Catechesis of the Good Shepherd. If you would like to know more about Catechesis of the Good Shepherd, or if you would like to become a member, please go to cgsusa.org. Thank you all for listening. We will see you in two weeks. Go and fall more deeply in love with God.